Welcome. I'm Dr. Patricia Pelica, a cardiologist, professor of medicine, and director of the Echocardiography Laboratory in Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. It's my pleasure to welcome today Dr. Steve Kopetsky, who is professor of medicine, uh, a cardiologist in our division, and also president of the American Society for Preventive Cardiology. Steve has been involved with many important clinical trials involving patients with coronary artery disease. Steve, welcome. Thank you, Patty. What would you say is the best option for the initial treatment of patients with stable coronary artery disease? Well, that's a very good question and, a, and somewhat controversial <clears throat> until recently in that there have been multiple trials that have tried to answer this and the trials have really come up with the idea that optimal medical therapy is the best initial treatment for these patients. And what is meant by optimal medical therapy? Well, that is another good question, and, it's, and uh, it is becoming clear that optimal medical therapy is not just things like beta blockers, which it is, <coughs> also aspirin, also if the patients still have angina, to give them long-acting nitrates and a, a long-acting calcium channel blocker, which are all generic. Also, if patients have a decreased left ventricular ejection fraction, they should be on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. But also, they should be on a statin. If they have coronary disease, they probably warrant a statin. And certainly, we need to pay attention to their, uh, their lifestyle, meaning their diet, a lower saturated fat diet. Certainly, regular activity, exercise for some, or just activity for others, at least 10 minutes, at least three times a week, to a vigorous level we know that will start to reduce their chances of having heart attacks and dying. How many patients are on that optimal medical therapy? Well, when you look across the board, uh, there have been recent studies that have tried to answer this, and even now, the uh, patients, less than half of them, are on optimal medical therapy at the time of angioplasty or stenting. While the guidelines are starting to say we need to put everyone on optimal medical therapy, before we send them for stenting. You haven't mentioned a role for coronary revascularization. How does that fit in the management of these patients? Yes, the, uh, the coronary revascularization, primarily uh, percutaneous uh, stenting, drug looting stents, has also been looked at. And what we have found is that it's better to put them on medical therapy if they fail the optimal medical therapy, meaning recurrent uh, angina, it just can't be controlled at the levels of activity the patient wants, then that's reasonable to opt for the, for the uh, revascularization. Now that's been looked at in studies and, and uh, there's been some mixed results in that sometimes that result will give a little more, uh, a little less angina to the patients that get percutaneously revascularized. However, across all the studies, there really is not a difference in angina in the patients that are treated optimally medically versus the ones that get angioplasty and stenting. So long-term treatment, um, so long-term treatment results with um, coronary angioplasty and stenting doesn't necessarily reduce symptoms. Yes, that's true. Now in the COURAGE study, uh, for the first one to two years, patients that got medical therapy had a little more angina than the ones that got stenting or angioplasty. However, after about two years, it was equal. But other studies have shown there really is not that much difference. And I think the key is that we, if we're real aggressive with treating the patients with anti-inflammatories, with anti-anginals, you can certainly control their angina. And uh, the key is to control recurrent plaque rupture. Most of the, of the plaques that rupture that cause new coronary syndromes are really not that tight of a plaque. Over half the time, it's not a significantly tight stenosis. And that helps to explain why the strategy of aggressive medical therapy, risk factor reduction, is probably just as good as the uh, idea of initial revascularization. That's very interesting. What percentage of patients will be, have their symptoms satisfactorily controlled with optimal medical therapy? Well, the, uh, you'll get much better control immediately in the first month or two, obviously, with uh, stenting. However, once you get past the, the initial few months, uh, almost everyone will get good control with symptoms either way. Now, the, the secret is with angioplasty, it's a one-time, it's a one-shot. You do it and they're better almost immediately. 
But with medical therapy, we sometimes have to titrate up. It's hard to take an elderly patient, put them on optimal medical therapy of beta blockers, nitrates, calcium channel blockers. We have to titrate up to that over a few months usually. So are patients satisfied with this approach of using medical therapy initially? Well, that is also a very good question in that if you poll uh, patients and you poll referring cardiologists and poll interventional cardiologists initially and ask them what benefit will there be from, uh, say, stenting, you know, the referring cardiologists, the interventional cardiologists uh, readily say that we don't reduce mortality with stenting for initial therapy. We don't really reduce their angina much. We don't reduce their chances of heart attack much. However, if you ask a patient, over 80% of patients feel that the stenting as initial therapy will help them live longer, will reduce their chance of a heart attack, reduce their chance of uh, a death. And so there's a, there's a mismatch there between what we know is reality and what the patient's perceptions are. So it's up to us, I think, to help explain this to patients, that medical therapy for initial, uh, initial treatment is really quite good, quite safe, and quite satisfactory to their outcomes. So to summarize, an appropriate therapy for patients with stable coronary artery disease is to first use optimal medical therapy. And that includes not only the appropriate medications for the patient, but also important lifestyle changes including diet, tobacco avoidance, and regular physical exercise. Thanks for joining us, Steve. Thank you for having me, Patty. And thank you for joining us.